My name's Guy Kestivan. I'm a writer, rider and historian and cycling and mountain bike content creator. And this is my recce ride on the new Marcher Castles Way for Cycling UK before writing up the guidebook. So it's a 300 kilometer route down through the borderlands of Shropshire and Wales, uh, the so-called Welsh marches uh, with loads of history, stunning scenery, beautiful back lanes, some exciting and some more mellow off-road as well. And I'm gonna be doing it in three parts, hopefully. So this is part one. Before we get riding, just a quick word on the beautiful market town of Shrewsbury, which is kind of famous for these stunning medieval buildings, over 660 listed buildings here in Shrewsbury. Uh, first settlement uh, evidence is from the Neolithic. There's Bronze Age, Iron Age and Roman evidence nearby as well, but really came to fame uh, in the Anglo-Saxon period where it was fortified by the daughter of Alfred the Great before becoming a really, really important town under the Norman Conquest. Uh, Lord Montgomery uh, was given given Shrewsbury to look after. He set up a monastery here. He built the castle here and that monastery went on to become one of the most important monasteries in the whole of the UK. Uh, carried on being super important, uh, both commercially for the wool trade and border trade, but also a real, real kingpin in terms of, you know, controlling this area. We'll go all the way through this route. We'll hear about the various struggles and castles and wars being fought, but the Battle of Shrewsbury here between King Henry and Harry Hotspur was fought just outside of town. Uh, it was really important in the Civil War and it's still a really lively, bustling town today. And dead easy uh, rail links, and it's also not far off the motorway if you come in through Telford. So, that's a quick dot on Shrewsbury. Let's ride out of town towards another town that isn't even occupied anymore. The Roman town of Roxeter. That is a beautiful start to the ride. Underneath the old castle mound, along the river side. And now we're onto our first bit of gravel of the adventure. The old Shropshire Canal Way towards Telford. Just be a bit careful watching out for those National Cycle Network 81 signs to keep you on the right track coming out of town because there is a bit of ducking and diving through an estate little residential estate so just keep your eyes peeled to keep yourself on track don't go getting lost in the first two I should probably say straight away that this isn't a waymark route although I will be producing a full guidebook with Cycling UK which will have GPX map codes and maps on the back pages to keep you on track and there we have it the old canal so make sure you don't fall into that but do keep an eye out for dragonflies and other beauties oh what a superb start well isn't this just beautiful this is Upton Magna <laughs> beautiful little spot about 9k out of Shrewsbury. I think this is going to be a stunner folks. And just watch out for this little cheeky bridleway turn down here about 11k in depending how lost you got at the start. So you're off the road and onto the grass track. And when you're not on bridleway you're generally on beautiful, quiet, single track, hedgerow lined roads like this. And now, we're just coming past the site of the Roman city of Roxeter. It was the furthest city legionary fortress on the end of Watling Street, which is a road that ran all the way from Dover and it was used as a jumping on, off point for the Roman invasion of Wales. And it had a uh, Thracian cavalry garrison here. See, they've built some of it back up. But the unique thing about Roxeter 
is that it's not been built on since uh, the Saxon development all took place in Shrewsbury, actually, on the edge of the River Severn. So there are marching camps nearby here, but uh, Roxeter has been completely left alone. And while it was a military base from 55 to 88, the Legion then moved to Chester, further north, and it became a really important civilian settlement with it was the fourth largest city in the Roman uh, UK, in Roman Britain at one point, with uh, 15,000 inhabitants, they reckon. So this whole area is uh, full of Roman remains. And it was the site of famous ex excavations with Philip Barker and Graham Webster, which was uh, the basis for a lot of what I studied at university when I was doing archaeology at Exeter. Um, it's superb. And just a beautiful, it's a beautiful part of the country anyway. And they reckon it got its name after the hill fort that's on the Reekin, that big hill in the distance. You can guess where we're going next, can't you? And as is often the way, people afterwards weren't going to leave good stone to waste. So, as you can see, the gateway to St Andrew's Church in Roxeter Village is in fact formed from two Roman columns. And the font inside, apparently, is formed from a column head. There you go, that resourceful. All half timbered and thatched. Lovely house. And that there is the famous Reekin, where you, which isn't a volcano, like some people say, although it is a result of volcanic activity, and you can't see Snowdon, but you can see a long way into Snowdonia, and it probably wasn't made by a giant dropping a spade of earth that he was going to use to crush Shrewsbury before he met a cobbler who showed him all the shoes he had in his bag and said, oh, I wore all these shoes out just walking to Shrewsbury. You don't want to walk that far and trick the giant into just leaving this shovel of earth here. But it's a beautiful nature spot. It is over 400 metres high, and as you can see, very popular with hang gliders. But unfortunately, there's no legal way of getting up there on a bike. But if you, you know, obviously you want to park at the bottom and have a stroll up, then uh, incredible views of the surrounding countryside from up there, and a bit of a Shropshire icon. And you can't really see from here but right on top, there's a huge Iron Age hill fort, over 20 hectares, which is probably a lot to do with the Cornovi tribe, who were the local Celtic tribe. But despite the big hill forts, the Cornovi seem to be quite a peaceful lot, really, especially considering the later history of this area. Didn't do much with pottery, it's just some big old bowls for holding salt from Finchesha, because they quite a big land, tribal land, and a lot of jewellery and glassware, but don't see much in the way of weaponry around up here. Which, like I say, makes a change for the following millennia. But anyway, now we're off from Iron Age, the Iron Bridge itself. And this is Wenlo Little Wenlock, which looks like a lovely little quiet place until you find out there were two Bronze Age weapons hordes found here. And it's also home of the youngest girl ever hung for murder, aged 11. And now we're dropping into Colebrookdale, where Abraham Darby, in 1709, first used coke in his blast furnace to make iron, which meant to make cheaper iron of the same quality. And basically, start the Industrial Revolution. By 1800, this place was pretty much the heart of iron technology. I like Silicon Valley, but with metal. And this whole area is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site with 10 separate museums from this Colbertdale Museum of Iron through to Bliss Hill, which is a living Victorian village. It's a 
fascinating place. Come on, visit. So that's one of the original blast furnaces preserved there. But what Colbrook Dale became most famous for was really de ornate decorative ironwork like this. They even did the gates of some of the royal palaces and royal parks as well. That beautiful first stop for refreshments and a stroll around. Well, no, I mean, you strolled around at Roxeter, but you have to make sure you give time to uh, stop and have a stroll around and explore at Ironbridge. And that's the Ironbridge itself. Started in 1779 from uh, using iron cast here in Colbrookdale and finished on New Year's Day. 1781 the original cast iron bridge and one of the few still standing today plus it's just beautiful to look at stunning setting really is a beautiful valley but you know it is a bit sad to think this is where kind of all that industrial revolution those dark hideous visions you know the besom of converters spewing out fire 24 hours all the pollution that's kind of come from that but for now it's a beautiful spot just be aware that while iron bridge has lots of lovely calves pubs and ice cream kiosks to stop for a refreshment at the hill straight over the bridge is an absolute stinker so you'll need legs of iron and a steely resolve to get up it but that climb does earn you a visit to the beautiful Benthill Hall. It's an Elizabethan, mullion windowed. I mean, you can see the beautiful tall chimneys over there. It's run by the National Trust. So if you're a National Trust member, you can get in and look around the uh, beautiful oak panelled interior and uh, decorative plaster ceilings. And it's got beautiful walled gardens as well. And uh, it's even got a tea shop a little shepherd's hut tea shop uh, in the car park if you need refreshments but a thoroughly beautiful thoroughly english stop off on the way to much mainland and i'm guessing from the rocky ballast and the raised embankment and the gradual gradient that this is an old railway it's a beautiful bike path though as we head a little odd Wenlock Edge. And as you come into Wenlock, much Wenlock, you'll go past Gaskell Field, where William Penny Brooks held the first modern Olympics in 1850. And he would go on to form the Olympic Society that eventually set up the Olympics that are going on in Paris at this very moment. And much Wenlock is absolutely gorgeous town. First mention of it, Wenlock Priory, was set up in around 680. But it's been a prosperous little market town ever since. It is absolutely drop dead gorgeous here. And there's plenty of shops, tea rooms and cafes to make it a good stop off point. About 45k into the March of Castle's Way. While I said it's not actually signposted, do keep an eye out for those little blue horseshoes because they seem to be cropping up a lot. And now we've climbed off road out of Much Wenlock and we're contouring along beautiful ancient drove road. I just love to imagine the stories these old trackways can tell is these undoubtedly go back into prehistoric times and just think of all the stories that have played out along here the heartbreaks the adventures and the Wenlock Edge is full of stories of robbers and daring escapes from the troops of the Civil War you know aristocrats jumping 200 feet off cliffs on their horses, being saved by trees. And there's a legendary 
robber around here called Ipikin. And if you say his name three times, he'll appear by magic and throw you off the edge for taking his name in vain. And we're also on the Jack Mitten Way, which is named after one of Shropshire's, Shropshire's most infamous characters. An absolute personification of the Regency Rake, a proper upper class loon who particular penchant for hunting, whether it was snowing, whether he had clothes on, whether he'd broken bones, he was just a legendary as a kind of unstoppable figure of excess. He even used to encourage his stable boys to lead hunts for rats across icy lakes and ice skates. Proper loon. And while he is reputed to have a huge wardrobe, thousands of pairs of shirts and breeches and boots for hunting, he tended to often ignore them, even in the middle of winter, and just go hunting in the niff. But he was incredibly keen on his pets. He had over 2,000 pet dogs. He had a pet horse which lived in his house, had free range, he used to sleep on a rug by the fire. And when Time Team investigated his ancestral home, they put a remote camera into the crypt, found his coffin, and the skin of his favorite pet bear was draped over the top of it. A true English eccentric, or Mad Jack, was Mr. Jack Mitten. And this trail along Wenlock Edge is an absolute beauty. Pretty much perfect gravel biking. Just lovely rise and fall, well surfaced track. It's absolutely deserted. I mean, this is the height of the summer holidays. But apart from Ironbridge, barely seen a soul. And that's the beauty of this whole area. It's just massively underappreciated and undervisited. It's somewhere so beautiful and so interesting, so much history to it. Most people either pass straight by into Wales or just don't bother with it at all. So you'll probably have the trails to yourself whenever you come here. And that just feeds into this amazing, just serenity of these wild and ancient woods. Oh, beautiful, beautiful Shropshire. Yes, I think we do go up that. pair of Jack Mitten Spurs to get up here. And now we're in Kansas, Dorothy. What a stunning bit of riding this has been since much Wenlock. Absolutely beautiful. It's carrying on too. And this is the incredible Wilderhope Hall youth hostel where I stayed on my very first cycle touring trip with my mum and I think I was about 10 or 11 and we pedalled down from Langothlin to Ludlow and I remember having to clean the steps as my morning chore like you did in youth hostels back then a proper ancient medieval those proper like worn out steps Amazing place. The views out here are just stunning. Such an amazing part of the world. And again, completely deserted. I've not seen a soul since I've left much wedlock. That was about an hour or more ago. 
Are you? I think it's cracking. It's eggs as well. I've also been climbing for a while. This is what I've heard. These lanes are just amazing. It's just mile after mile after mile of them. Absolutely deserted. Perfectly surfaced. These huge old hedgerows protecting you from the wind or any weather. If it wasn't weather. Butterflies and hawks and buzzards and hares and rabbits. Or all other manner of furries and feathered friends. Just amazing, beautiful riding out here. And off we go again. That's another beautiful old farm. With ivy up the walls and flower in the verges. Amazing. Huh. Talk about unspoiled England. And if you've been cursing bringing a mountain bike up to this point, because it has definitely been gravelly, well, apart from the gear ratios you'd have needed, it's been favouring a gravel bike. This is definitely more of a mountain bike section, traversing across to the other hill, even with it bone dry. And it'd be more so if it's soggy. Still good fun on drops though. <laughs> And of course, what goes up must come down. But just be careful, it's because you get tighter, steeper and rockier as you come further down the Clee Hill descent. And then there's a gate. <laughs> oh, what a stunning place to be on a summer's evening. It's amazing, wide open heathland. And then looking over to the hills over there. Don't even know which they are. They're very pretty though. And now we're up the other Clee Hill. Brown Clee Hill. Fractionally smaller, but views still absolutely stunning up here. Whew. Again, you do have to earn them though. It's a very different beast. The quarrying is a lot more obvious, but it's still fascinating in its own respect. And you've even got an air traffic control radar up the top. And the descent off the top is a proper scorcher. I mean, literally, you should have snapped the brakes at that gate. And this little beauty is Furlong's Cottage which is perfect because we are kind of in the final furlong into Ludlow now that's this beautiful bit of old parkland what an amazing day this has been definitely back loaded in terms of effort though it really ramps up quite literally once you're out of Ironbridge, big hills, big climbs, and even some long climbs that end up being big, but don't seem like they're that steep at the time. Anyway, yeah, mellow start, quite a lumpy ending, but stunning all the way through. So, here I am in Ludlow. Castle over there, 
market getting ready there. Beautiful medieval houses there. The river's down there, which is where I'll be heading tomorrow for day two of the March of Castles Way. It's mostly, actually it's mostly been kind of Roman and Iron Age prehistoric castles so far. I think we really pitch into their medieval stuff. I mean, obviously, apart from Ludlow over there. Uh, but I'll, I'll chat to you more about Ludlow in the intro tomorrow morning. And uh, then we're properly getting into castle country as we head over the border into Wales. But today's been an absolutely stunning route. But I think it's going to be quite a different, quite a different kind of vibe tomorrow. A bit wilder, a bit hillier. But then to be fair, I've been amazed how incredibly kind of remote and quiet and wild it's felt in places today. Absolutely stunning ride. But so, thanks very much to uh, Cycling UK for getting me on board to uh, do the narrate these videos and to create the guidebook. Make sure you join Cycling UK. Uh, loads of benefits as well as uh, these routes. Uh, they also give you insurance, they give you special deals, you get a monthly magazine, and it's just a great group to be part of in terms of advocacy and campaigning, as well as us setting up routes like this. And make sure you join for part two. Ludlow, over to Montgomery. I forgot to say, if you've got any comments, if you've got any questions about the kit I'm using or sort of level of technical difficulty, that kind of thing, then of the route, then don't hesitate to jump in the comments below. Always very pleased to chat with people who are thinking of doing the route and uh, help out where I can. But uh, by the time the route opens, there'll probably be a very lively Facebook community uh, dedicated to the route because that's what's happened with all the other Cycling UK routes that have been set up. So if you've enjoyed this one, then don't forget to look at all the others, King Alfred's Way, Canty Way, West Kernow Way, Rebellion Way, Trouzuri, and uh, I think that's it. Yeah, so many good long distance routes that the Cycling UK have put together now. Really is something for everyone. But this, I think, just sits really nicely in the middle so far.